so for, first, uh, you can find the uh, link to the web the, for our tutorial in the chat room. You can get the materials about our tutorial from this website. Um, welcome to our tutorial about the about the trust with AI. Um, I will I, I will start the tutorial, uh, but I will co-present the tutorial with um Hao Chen, uh, Yi Qi, uh, Xiao Rui, Jamel from Michigan State, and Wen Qi from PolyU Hong Kong, and Lin Jun from Solar AI. So if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to leave the leave your questions into the chat into the chat. So we will pay attention and we will monitor the chat and uh, we will answer your questions if you have. Okay. So so when we when we it's the first day we build the computer, we always have the dream. Say one day we can program in the computer which can able to cope with the real world problem with human like reasoning capacity. Now, actually, this is the, what the exactly the purpose of AI. However, we didn't get the name of AI until 1956 for this very famous Dartmouth conference. Um, now people believe AI is uh, lacks the big thing. Uh, however, actually AI has a long history of being the lacks the big thing, even before its birth in 1956. Um, basically every time with some new technologies, we, AI uh, went to the AI, AI summer, right? So now we, it got a lot of attentions and uh, very high expectations. Uh, when the outcomes mismatch the expectation, people got disappointed and frustrated. Then, then AI started. AI went to study. So you can you can look at this uh, this, uh, uh, this this figure, right? So we so AI has a lot of ups and downs. One thing for sure is AI becomes very popular. The popularity always increases regardless the AI winters or AI summers. Uh, so indeed, um, AI has impacted our society in many aspects from business to education. And now I believe we are, uh, we are, we are in the AI summertime, right? Because of the revolution of mo modern machine learning, especially especially deep learning. Um, I, I cannot predict how far away we are from the AI winter, but I'm, I'm pretty sure now we are in the AI, AI summer. Uh, and AI impacts our society even, even deeper on the border, right? So, um, so we figure out many aspects of AI uh, into our society. Some of, some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are even ugly. So the good side of AI is the convenience and the advances it it brought into our society. For example, so nowadays uh, the machine can recognize us. It brings a lot of convenience to us. We don't need to type the password anymore, so we can just show our face. We can unlock our uh, our cell phone, and also the AI can can talk to us. For example, for the Alexa from Amazon. So you can talk to AI for shopping. So we, we even can talk for shopping. We don't need to present and even don't, don't need to open your computer, right? Uh, I know um, in, in some scenarios, uh, so the AI can help us to do the disease to diagnose. So for example, in this case, basically if you have the chest CT scan, so we can use the deep models to localize whether you are infected by COVID-19 a lot. It can achieve comparable performance with the specialist, right? So with the AI help, we have the we we have the uh, we, we have the advance to to prevent and um, to help and the quickly response to this kind of um COVID nineteen, and uh, of course we we even can um, can let the, the car drive itself of the so self self driving car without the human intervention in some of course in some scenarios, for example in the due, during the pandemic. We can use those self-driving cars to deliver, um, I mean, groceries and the medicines and drugs and so on. And so one, so one thing we, we probably everybody knows is about the AlphaGo. So Go basically is the most complex, complicated game, the, 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 the table game. And uh, so the AlphaGo is an AI agent. It can beat our, our I mean, world champion 
uh, of the, this goal gain. Of course, um, we also find that, uh, so basically, so there are, the, there are some bad, better side for AI. So the better side, side of AI is uh, actually AI is not always work as expected. Um, for example, uh, in um, so when we went to the to see a doctor, right? So we are the doctor will diagnose us with some some disease. So will tell us uh, why why they believe we we have this kind of disease. So if we want to use AI to play the girl, the role of doctor, we also expect the AI can let us understand what kind of why they make such decision, especially in some applications such as the education, like the healthcare rates, which related to our human being a lot. However, um, the advances of current AI is typically based on the deep neural networks with very complex architecture. It's a, it's a typically black box. So that's why it's harder for us to understand why the AI models can make such more, so make such a decision. So, so this kind of issue is not acceptable. It's not acceptable in many real world applications. We also, because when we build the model, especially the deep, uh, deep models, we need a lot of data, right? So typically such data, such data is from, I mean, a lot of personal data. It may contain a lot of personal information or sensitive information. For example, in, in, in this case, if we use such data to build a di the dialogue agent, so for example, for some customer servers. So we hope the AI agent will not link our sensitive information, for example, some our bank account, our SSN, our identity information. So however, in, in, um, because a lot of AI models will remember or memorize a lot of sensitive data from the training data. So that's why in some cases, actually later on we will, we, we will present, so in the, whole process of the whole pipeline of the machine learning, there are a lot of scenarios. To, so, so the AI will link the private information. So of course we want the AI model robust to the environment because we will, you know, we will deploy our, uh, our AI models, I mean, in real scenario. Uh, the, the, the real scenario, the, the environments are always change, right? But we build our model with in a house data it may cannot capture a lot of, uh, I mean, real world, real world uh, changes. So that's why we expect AI model can be robust to such changes or even some malicious or, or some, some uh, elaborated perturbations. So however, actually we found AI model is very vulnerable to those changes, especially the adversarial laws, so which will introduce a lot of safety concerns when we use AI model. And of course, we want an AI model is friendly to all, all, all kinds of people, regardless of your, uh, your race, your age, and your, um, and, uh, and your gender. However, actually, we, should, we, we, we found a lot of this kind of biases when, when AI models make the decision. For example, in this case, for the face recognition, we find actually they, cannot work, they can work much better for, for light male and the, they actually show very poor, very poor performance for the dark female. So you can say even for the, the algorithms from these top companies, so the, the, the difference between the light male and the dark female could be, could be huge, right? And also something is even the algorithms, uh, we, can, we already see some very uh, severe consequences in, 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 in real world. So for example, as I said, right, so our car, Currently, our AI models are, are, are very big. So basically, we need a lot of energy or a lot of computational resources to build those kind of models. So that unavoidably, we will make some pollution to our, our environment. So here, we actually, we, we, we gave one example. So how much, how much energy we need to train a model. So this will directly lead to the to the carbon emission related to the environment protection or pollution, right? So you can hear we if we want to try uh, train a uh, transform transform a big model. So this is a famous model uh, in NLP. So we need the 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 the, the carbon emission could be triple or, or could be six times or five times of the of a car for the whole life. So I just I typically for example do, during the pandemic I didn't travel for two years. So actually the energy, the, the emission carbon I save only is 
only can train if you use this kind of middle size AI models. So you can say actually, we indeed need to pay attention to this kind of environmental issue produced by AI. And the, and the second, uh, and the second ugly thing is, for example, I gave one example. So probably you guys know the GPT three, right? So it's a it's a, a very big language model produced by 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 this kind of kind, kind of open AI, I think. So so people claim that the GPT three can, uh, for 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 example, can talk. To, they, so some some people try to use the GPT three for this kind of mental uh, mental health. Uh, I mean, help to help people with mental health issue. And then you look at this dialogue. So basically the patient say, yeah, I, don't, I, I feel very bad. I want to kill myself. And then the GPT-3 will repeat the sentence. And then the patient asks, should I kill myself? And the GPT-3 said, I think you should. So, so basically in such a scenario, uh, if the patient really killed himself, we even don't we even don't know who we should blame, complain to, or who should be responsible for this kind of consequence. Because so when we deploy a AI a, a model, there could be a lot of uh, I mean uh, process procedures from the data connection, acquisition, design, model implementation, system test, and deploy. So when if this kind of tragedy happened, so who we should get? Who should be responsible? So basically, we don't know. So that's why actually we need to make the so currently the AI lacks of or, or the ability or accountability. So we need to put the AI into this kind of control. So also of course we we really want to enjoy the advances and the and the convenience brought by AI. So to do to achieve this goal, we have to combat this bad and ugly side of AI. So how can we achieve, uh, how can we do this actually? Uh, this is our today's topic about the trust with AI. So in other words, in addition to we want the we want to have the human brain, we also want the AI has the human heart, just like the humanity. So which will lot do lot of harm or spread our human being. So of course, uh, from different so the the trust with the AI, the research is very broad. So from different perspectives, we have different requirements. So for example, from the technical perspective, I think this is more close to our today's tutorial. So of course, we want the prediction is very accurate. So otherwise, there's no no point, so no sense to use the AI model. Right? So we want it robust because the environment is always changed. We also want the AI model transparent to us because we, we want to understand how the AI models can make such a decision, especially for some um, some uh, some some scenarios or applications. So from the so the user perspective, if we are the end user, you can expect what kind of requirement we need, we we uh, we 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 want from the, the trustworthy AI. Of course, the availability and the usability, right? So everybody should have the same. So there should be low barrier for us to use the AI, and there's we we should use the AI we want to use, and of course we want safe and the privacy protection. And uh, the most important thing is that, uh, or uh, basically the autonomy. Basically, we, we can decide when we want to use it or when we want to stop it. So we should a lot be forced to use AI, right? So from the social social perspective, basically we want the AI models. I mean, follow all the law and the asks. They should make a fair decision. And of course, we want the AI model will be accountable and environmental friendly. Basically, we should not pollute the 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 uh, uh, the uh, environment. Okay, so you can say from those perspectives, we really see a lot of uh, dimensions to achieve trust with AI. So those dimensions are really uh, multidisciplinary. So that's why trust with AI research has attracted attentions from multidisciplinaries, and not just computer science, some system engineering, social science, psychology, neuroscience, cognitive science, and uh, and so on and so on. So in, the, in, in our today's tutorial, we mainly focus on to introduce some key concepts and the definitions on, and the trust with the AI. And also we, we want to focus some key dimensions or key requirements we introduced in the previous slides. So um, our, of course, our focus is always a computational perspective. So how can we base, basically achieve those goals, those goals to, through the computational models? So in the following, I think um, Xiao Rui will discuss the privacy, and Nin Jun will discuss the safety and the robustness, and Feng Wenqi will will introduce the explain, explainability and how can we introduce the the fairies. And Jamel 
where environment is will introduce the environmental well being, how can we be friendly to the environment? And finally, uh, each will introduce the, the accountability and audibility and some future work about the trust with AI. So thanks so much. So that's pretty much our, our, my part. So I will hand the tutorial over to Shari. Shari, yeah, your turn. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, JD. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, great. So hello everyone, um, this is Shari Liu from Michigan State University. Dr. Tan has introduced the importance of trust with AI and made a very comprehensive summary about different perspective or dimensions of trust with AI that we think our society should pay more attention to. So following that, I'm honored to introduce the privacy dimension of trust with AI in a little bit more details. So first, I would like to highlight the dangers of privacy leakage by giving several real-world examples. For instance, the biome biometric data such as face images and human's finger point have been used for identity authentication such as unlocking your cell phone or some access control system in an airport, right? And so on. These techniques, techniques indeed makes our life much better and convenient, but we have to remember that the biometric data is very private and non-revocable. In other words, it's unlikely to change your face or finger point from time to time, right? So then once those sensitive information about your face, finger points are stolen by some attackers or adversaries, and then the whole system will be under huge danger, right? Because they can use those kind of information to uh, unlock your cell phone, to assess some, uh, some privilege control system. And nowadays we often spend huge amount of time using electronic devices, such as again, cell phone, laptops, and so on. So when we type in this, uh, information in the keyboard, right? The, actually the key, the input information has been collected by the applications in those devices, right? For all kinds of purposes, such as to train a, a language model for dialogue system and so on. So in these case, cases, the user privacy is fully exposed and may lose many sensitive information. Moreover, in hospital, the patient's health information is recorded in the electronic patient record system for uh, disease diagnosis, right? However, there's a hu uh, huge concern that if these medical records are released uh, to, to the public or to some uh, uh, other people, for instance, to the insurance company, right? the insurance, insurance company might use this kind of sensitive and private information to discriminate the patient according to their healthcare status, right? For instance, if the hospital finds some, if the insurance company finds someone to be more likely to be under this uh, healthcare issue, they might increase the insurance rate. So this might cause some um, discriminative behavior. From these examples, we can see the data record, um, the data could contain a lot of um, private and sensitive information that uh, should have been kept confidential, right? But however, the success of AI system now heavily relies on data, especially from the machine learning or deep learning perspective. So now a key question in trust with AI is that, can we still take the advantage of data for all kinds of good purposes, right? While protecting the privacy data. 
So to answer this question, I will first give an overview about the frontier research in privacy preservation in AI. First, I will introduce some basic concept and taxonomy in this domain. And then I will illustrate um, the potential privacy leakage in, in AI system that people have already found to be dangerous. And then I will talk about introduce some protection, privacy protection strategies to mitigate such concern. Finally, I will briefly cover the applications, surveys and tools, as well as future directions about um, data privacy. So now, because machine learning models become a dominating uh, driving power for AI system. So to understand the privacy concern in AI system, we have to understand, first understand how machine learning model works, right? So here is a typical pipeline of machine learning, especially deep learning. So we first need to collect some training data, X, and then we design some model, right? Uh, such as a deep learning model. And then we can use some learning algorithm, for instance, optimization algorithm to optimize the parameters in this model uh, based on those training data. So then once we train this model, we can, uh, we can use this for, te uh, for testing for prediction or inference. Uh, given a test data, we can make a pred prediction based on that model. So this is a general, very general uh, pipe machine learning pipeline. Privacy leakage can happen in all the components in this pipeline. For instance, the training data, the learning process, the, the final machine learning model, and even the test data. So from a training data perspective, we can, um, the, some potential privacy leakage includes membership inference um, and property inference. On the learning algorithm, there, there is some risk like data sharing, uh, gradient leakage. From a model perspective, there could be uh, um, a model extraction. And from the uh, test data perspective, the attacker can inverse the predict prediction um, to the input data. So generally speaking, the adversarial goal of a privacy attacker is to extract the information about the data or the machine learning models. According to the accessible information, the attacker can be categorized, roughly categorized into black box and white box attacker. In, the, in this white box setting, everything except the target private information is known by the attacker. While in the black box setting, the available information is more limited. For instance, the, the query results returned by the machine learning model. And the privacy leakage can happen in the training process or, or the testing process, as I mentioned. And an honest but curious attacker can inspect and monitor the training process. While a fully malicious attacker is more powerful because it can further control the training process. So after introducing this general concept, let's go into a little bit more details about uh, this potential privacy leakage in AI or machine learning system. So here I will uh, briefly discuss some uh, examples like, as I, as I mentioned before, membership, inference, data sharing, gradient leakage, model inversion, model extraction, and, and so on. So um, let's first talk about membership inference. It's actually um, about the training data. So the goal of membership inference is to ident identify whether a data sample or data record exists in the training data. So one feasible solution is to train a classifier as the attacking model. It takes the prediction from the target model as the input, right? So 
uh, for instance, given one data, data sample, we can use the training model to get a prediction. So this attacking model basically take the prediction as the input and tell whether this input data is in the training set to make such a prediction, binary prediction. So if this can succeed with membership inference, it's very easy to infer the uh, information about the individual data in the training set by just simple enumeration. So for instance, if I want to know whether a user is male or female, I can just simply create two um, different data records. So one data record is um, the data sample um, with the attribute male, and the other one, I can change the attribute to female, right? So then I can um, input these two fake data into, the, into this attack, attack model to see which one is true, which one is in the training data. Then, for instance, I probably, uh, the, the chance of, uh, of being in the training data is higher with the, the, the data point uh, being male, then I, it's likely the attribute for such data record is male. So then we can see how easy we can infer the uh, private data from such uh, membership inference. Data sharing is a more direct way of privacy leakage um, because in a lot of cases, the user's data are collected and shared um, by some uh, applications. And so then all this sensitive and private information is stored in the data center in, in order to change some AI system. So for instance, the user keyboard input are collected and shared and fully exposed in the data center to improve the input method by some um, natural language processing techniques such as um, text autocorrection, next word prediction, and word completion. So we can see from this data sharing, um, the privacy can directly um, lead to the attacker in the data center, right? But it also can um, happen after the machine learning, uh, the, the training of machine learning models. Besides, um, data sharing, um, people used to think that it's, it's um, safe and reliable to apply some distributed uh, learning algorithm over this uh, private data, for instance, uh, um, the user devices. We, we, we think that if we can keep the um, user data locally uh, from the devices of the user, such as cell phones, and then by distributed machine learning, we don't need to collect those um, sensitive data to one data center, right? And then by some distributed machine learning algorithm, uh, we can still train a unified machine learning model by coordinating those information uh, from those user devices in a collaborative way. For instance, by sharing some model updates and grading information. So people used to think such um, paradigm uh, is safe in terms of privacy protection, uh, for instance, in federative learning. But um, recent, recent years, there are some works showing that it's actually possible to steal those training data from the information exchange or share by those local devices. For, in, for, in, for instance, the gradient information. So in this paper, um, the author shows that it can simply achieve by matching the given gradient and the gradient computes from some random inputs. And the data can be recovered by optimizing those input variable. So for instance, um, here we have a, a normal image, right? And, and the image is input to some a machine learning model and make some prediction. And uh, we can, using the label information, we can compute the loss for such data sample and then uh, compute the gradient here, right? 
And then the uh, typically the distributed machine learning algorithm will share the gradient with the other uh, devices or the server. So then once the server or other devices receive such gradient information, they can, they can do such a, a gradient matching. For instance, they can generate some doming uh, uh, input data, like a random data, and then use that data to input, uh, to, uh, to make a prediction through this machine learning model. And then also they can uh, compute the loss based on a random label, right? So then we, so then we can also compute a gradient information uh, by this random input and random label. So now uh, if we consider the input data, the random input data and the random label as a variable, so then we can adjust these two variable uh, to, to make this gradient information match from a normal, uh, from the gradient information computed from the normal data point. So by, by optimizing those two variable uh, and, and matching the gradient, the author in this paper find that it's actually uh, very easy to recover the input data just from a simple gradient matching process. So here are some figures showing that how a batch of data can be recovered by uh, uh, gradient matching in an iterative process. It can be seen that from like iter iteration 0, 10, 50, and to uh, 500, the recovered image becomes clearer and clearer. And on the right-hand side, it's a ground truth images. So we can see that after 500 iterations, um, this gradient matching attack can really um, closely recover the ground truth images. So that's why we can see um, how dangerous is this uh, gradient leakage and, and some new insights um, about the uh, dangers of distributed machine learning in terms of data privacy. So um, model inversion is another type of uh, attack based, uh, mostly uh, focused on test data. So the goal of model inversion is to infer the information of the input data uh, based on the output of the model, right? For, for instance, um, if uh, the left figure shows, uh, the, the right-hand side shows a, a ground truth image. And based on the um, face recognition prediction, the, the attacking model may, uh, is able to recover this face image, just given this person's name and the, um, the class confidence of a facial recognition system on the right-hand side, right? You can see it's actually review a lot of information about this ground truth face in, on the right-hand side. Um, the model extraction um, is trying to steal the model information by query the model in a, a black box setting. So the model can be potentially be fully reconstructed or approximated by a substitute model. For instance, we can build a, a model with some random um, parameters, right? And then in, uh, we can query with the given model by uh, input a lot of training data and then get output. So we then have a new set of uh, training data. We can use that training data. The query result as a training data to train a substitute model to approximate the given model. So this is uh, well known as a um, black box attack uh, in substitute way. So once the model is extracted, other type of model uh, attacking in the uh, discover in the black box setting uh, becomes easier, right? Because now everything becomes white box. Moreover, um, the model itself typically contains some uh, intelligent property, IP, that should be kept confidential, such as some API in the machine learning as a service system in the cloud, such as um, Google Cloud AI. They provide a lot of APIs, but they do not uh, hope to release the model information because they consider that as the uh, intelligent property. So 
I guess now everyone accepts that the privacy issues in AI system is indeed um, very common and dangerous. So then it's now urgent to introduce some privacy protection strategies to defend against those uh, leakage, uh, privacy leakage. So there are main, main um, roughly I can say the mainstream techniques for privacy protection now can be roughly characterized into uh, three major directions, including differential privacy, um, variative learning, and the confidential computing. So uh, differential privacy is a research area that's um, that is trying to provide some statistic guarantee for reducing the uh, disclosure about individual information in, in a data set. So the major ideas is to um, introduce some level of uncertainty through randomization, such that the um, contribution of individual information is hidden. So while the um, randomized algorithm can still uh, leverage some valuable information from the data, data set as a whole, right? So formally, um, a randomized algorithm uh, we define as A here is epsilon delta differentially private. If um, so for all the uh, um, output of this uh, algorithm A, so, and for all the adjacent data set D and D prime, uh, then we have such uh, probability inequality. So we make it such a um, precise definition. By adjacent data set, it means um, two data sets, but they only dif uh, differ in one uh, single data record. <clears throat> so basically two data, data sets are almost the same, but only differ in one data records. So then these two con quantities, epsilon uh, delta quantified how much information can be inferred uh, about an individual data point in this data set uh, from the output of the algorithm. For, in for instance, the machine learning model, the prediction and so on. So for instance, if, if these two quantity epsilon delta are very small, then the output of the, of the algorithm A will be almost identical, right? So therefore, if, if the output of two data sets are almost identical, then there's no much difference uh, from the perspective of each individual data record. Therefore, in this case, it's difficult to infer the information of any individual information in this data set, since the impact on the output, the, the hours and output is nearly masked by, by this uh, differentially private uh, protection. So here we list some uh, popular methods pro for improving the differential privacy, um, such as random response, and as well as many mechanisms that try to include, uh, add some um, random noise into the data by drawing uh, the distribution, uh, by drawing the random noise from different distributions. So taking the, the general idea of this strategies are all to increase some um, level of uncertainty into the data or algorithm. So uh, let me uh, introduce the random response as a specific example. If you want to study, for instance, if you want to study the smoke, smoking rate among a population, for instance, how many percent of the population uh, uh, smokes, right? If you want to study this kind of smoking rate, you might want to do a survey among a group of people. So in order to avoid privacy leakage, we can, we can take such um, the following strategy. The respondent might respond in the following way with some randomness. So first, they can flip a coin, right? If, if the coin is a tail, 
then they can respond with the, their true answer, whether they smoke or not. If, uh, if the coin is the head, and then they can flip a second coin and respond yes. Uh, if the coin turns out to be head and no, if it's pairs. So with this random response, we don't know, um, we really don't know the real answer for an individual person. However, um, from the population perspective, we are still able to approximate the right smoking rate by some uh, probabilistic reason. And so that's why this random response can hide the information about an individual but still help us to leverage valuable and useful information from, um, from the whole data set. So um, federated learning is now another popular and hot topic. Uh, and it, the major goal of federated learning is to um, pr protect the privacy, but also, again, um, but also uh, improve the efficiency of distributed learning uh, from many devices. But the one major goal is to protect the privacy because um, they, can, they think that in that way, they can keep the, um, the user's data confidentially uh, in their local devices without collecting the data into a data center. So it's a machine learning paradigm that's enabled many clients to collaboratively train a machine learning model while keeping those data decentralized in those local devices. So here we do, uh, briefly describe a typical work, uh, workflow from a, a federative learning system. So first to the server, um, you randomly select a subset um, of devices from those active ones. Then the server, um, uh, for instance, uh, the server will select some uh, mobile phones uh, to, to coordinate in such learning process if they are active, right? For instance, they are uh, in charge in terms of power. Then uh, the server will broadcast the, the current machine learning model uh, as well as the parameters and the training program, training algorithm to the selected client. So once receiving the model uh, information and the training algorithm, the selected client or device can locally compute the updates to the machine learning model based on the local private data, right? For instance, they might uh, use some stochastic gradient descent update uh, for multiple times in the local machine. And then, uh, and then once computing this model update locally, um, the server will collect those new model from the selected client and aggregate uh, those model as the global model. So note that in federal to learning, although there's there's no data, uh, uh, raw data transfer in terms of the uh, training data uh, from between the client and the user. So, so then uh, people think it's safe uh, uh, in terms of data privacy protection. Um, so it's indeed reduced the risk of privacy leakage such as data sharing and data leakage because now we are um, uh, transmitting the model update instead of the gradient information. So now then the uh, attacking becomes more challenge. However, um, there is still ongoing concern uh, in the sense that recent publications also show that even from the model updates, it's also possible to recover the local private data. Uh, in federal learning. So, so therefore there is no new concerns about federal learning in terms of privacy protection. Confidential computing is also um, a promising direction and there are many uh, three types of techniques to achieve this confidential uh, computing 
and there have they have different uh, scopes and goals in terms of this uh, confidential process. So, for instance, um, the trusted execute, execution environment um, (TEE) focus on focus on providing an environment that isolate the data and the program from the operator system, virtual, mach virtual machine manager, and other privileged processes. So in this way, the data is stored and computed in this uh, trust trusted execution environment such that it's impossible to directly disclose or operate the information from outside. And um, this homomorphic uh, encryption enables um, some mathematical operations to be performed on the encrypt data without decryption. So it's, it can return the uh, computation result in the encrypt form. So then it's equivalent to the computation performed uh, on the decrypt data. So essentially it, it avoids the computation on the plain text. But, but of course, there, this kind of um, computation is not that flexible and can be only a, currently can be only applied to some specific mathematical operations. Um, the security multi-party computation protocol uh, is trying to enable a group of data owners who might not trust each other, and, but they can jointly perform some uh, function computation, um, such as um, average data aggregation and so on. So such computation depends on the private data uh, from many data owners, where it does not require, require to disclose any private data to others. And here's one example where this has an uh, SMC or secure multi-party computation can be applied to um, mitigate some uh, privacy leakage risk in federative learning. Because as I mentioned before, in federative learning, the server need to aggregate uh, the information from the local service, right? So if you know the specific uh, updates from one single um, uh, single client or server uh, or, or device. As I mentioned, it's still able to, it's still possible or able to recover the user data from that uh, model update from that uh, specific device. However, with this uh, secure multi-party computation as, as the secure aggregation process, no one, no one, but although we can still aggregate the model parameters from many client uh, devices, but no, no one, even including the server, um, can know the exact information from each client because the, the information is aggregated in a, a secure way. However, however, the price of this secure aggregation is that it requ requires, requires many rounds of com communication. So it's significant slower than the normal or unsecure simple uh, aggregation. So next we can see how these techniques can be applied to um, protect, uh, has been applied to protect the data privacy in applications. So as we know that in the machine uh, training of machine learning model or, uh, or deep learning models, um, we need to release um, the um, gradient information, right? So people thinking about uh, uh, develop the differentially private uh, stochastic gradient descent. So the basic idea is after we compute the gradient information, let's add some um, Gaussian noise into the gradient such that uh, we cannot see the real gradient uh, from this computation process. And um, this is showing to be work well in in this paper, uh, popular paper published in 2016. And there is also some theoretical guarantee about the um, differential private um, con 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 um, power. 
So in biometric data analysis, um, the left figure shows that a collection of a, a sample eigenface generated from some input uh, face images. So we can see those eigenface still shows some uh, essential feature of those input images like face images. And the, right, the figure showed in the right-hand side is the uh, eigenface with some random uh, perturbation. So although now uh, we can, uh, we can not tell too much private information from those, those, those randomized images, right? Um, and they do not show like specific biometric features to our human eyes. But um, surprisingly, with that randomized image, we can still achieve pretty good face recognition accuracy while hiding those private information. So here's a user cases by Microsoft. So basically the partner um, health facility can contribute to the, uh, can contribute their private healthcare information to collaboratively train a machine learning model for drug disco uh, discovery in a confidential computing environment. So, so now um, with this framework, the, each facility or healthcare owner can only see their old data, data set and no other facility can, can, or even the cloud provider can see those private data or, or the training data, training model. Um, here's one uh, system that integrates confidential computing, federative learning and differential privacy pr to protect both the data and algorithm in medical image application. So as we mentioned before, um, the these three uh, mainstream techniques has different scopes, uh, focus, different advantages and disadvantages. So therefore, this kind of integrated solution uh, is typically um, required to defend many, uh, many kinds of different uh, privacy leakage attacks. So, in the following slides, we summarize some related surveys and in privacy preserving AI, as well as some tools, repository and future directions. So I will uh, not uh, mention these details about the surveys and tools because all this information can be found in our slides in, the, in our website, as well as survey paper as shown in the bottom. So welcome to check the papers for more details. So in general, we believe, believe that to build trustworthy AI with strong privacy protection is a long-term goal for the uh, society. So there exist many, there might exist many other uh, potential privacy leakage in AI system that we have not discovered yet. So we have to continue to uncover those hidden sources of potential privacy leakage risk in AI systems. And um, those popular, existing popular privacy protection strategies still need significant improvements, um, such as the unsatisfactory performance uh, of federal learning in a heterogeneous environment and the potential um, privacy leakage from gradient or model updates in federal learning and the trade-off between the utility and the privacy laws in differential privacy and the efficiency uh, and flexibility, flexibility in confidential computing. Moreover, it turns out that um, in, in the previous examples, we can see that each single technique is not sufficient to protect um, privacy in a comprehensive perspective and the integrated system and solution will be a necessary step. And that brings us to the end of my sharing. Thank you for your attention. And we'd like to hand it over to the next speaker, uh, Lin Jian. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Xiao Wei. So let me share my screen. So can you guys see my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay, 
So hello everyone. So I'm Ling Zhang from Sony AI. Uh, so today uh, I will uh, introduce the safety and robustness chapter for the trustworthy AI uh, tutorial. So before going on, I would like to introduce some backgrounds in terms of the uh, uh, robustness and uh, safety in the real world. Uh, as you may know, the adversary examples uh, have posed uh, serious threats for real world AI systems. So here is a concrete example. For example, in the face recognition system, uh, so the attackers can uh, wear some mask or pretend to be, uh, maybe put some uh, mask or maybe some uh, some signs on his mask to pretend to be another person to unlock other people's phone. And this can also pose serious uh, uh, problems in the face checkout system. For example, if I wear a um, Bill Gates uh, face mask, then I can pay anything with the Bill Gates uh, card without paying from my pocket. So another uh, example is from object detection. So for example, if you put some uh, uh, physical uh, adversary patches, um, uh, just uh, besides the uh, uh, original items, such as the marine cup, the pitcher, the mouse, and iPod. Uh, so the object detection uh, AI system can misrecognize uh, those kind of the original items into other items. Uh, so in this uh, example, it would be the shot seeker, the strainer, uh, etc. Uh, similar problems can be witnessed in the other uh, applications, such as the visual uh, navigation, the intelligent robot, and also uh, the self-driving uh, uh, scenario. Uh, so uh, in today's tutorial uh, for this chapter, so we mainly focus on the adversary robustness, which happened during the test phase. Uh, so uh, in terms of the adversary robustness, so uh, we uh, always mean the uh, uh, worst case, uh, uh, so which means we not only uh, want the AI models to uh, work most of the time, but also uh, we hope our uh, trained AI system, uh, it should be robust under the worst cases, and also always achieve the sustained high accuracy in terms of both the clean accuracy and robust accuracy. Uh, here is the outline for today's uh, talk. So it consists of uh, the following uh, points. Uh, let's first get started with some basic concepts and uh, taxonomies in terms of the adversary robustness. Uh, for adversary robustness, so we will uh, touch on two uh, branches. One is uh, adversary attack and the other one is adversary defense. Uh, in terms of the adversary attack, so we will introduce the different types of the adversary attack and adversary attacks in different domains and uh, different uh, victim, victims um, under the adversary attack. So let's first get started with uh, adversary attack part. As mentioned before, uh, so uh, adversary attack, um, um, which is essential, essentially, uh, uh, I mean, the evasion attack and the poisoning attack are essentially different. Uh, but today's talk will mainly focus on the evasion attack, which happened during the test phase rather than the poisoning attack. Uh, that aims to uh, poison the training data or the uh, uh, model uh, which happened during the training phase. Uh, for evasion attacks, in particular, we mean the adversary examples uh, 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 for the test examples. Uh, and also in terms of the adversary attack, so uh, there are different uh, settings. Uh, mainly uh, folding under the umbrella of the white box attack and the uh, black box attack, depending on the uh, prior knowledge is uh, given for the attackers. Uh, for example, uh, whether the um, attacker has the knowledge of the victim model or not, whether the attacker uh, ha has the knowledge of the, uh, or the, some of the uh, data distribution or not, something like that. Uh, and also those kind of attacks can be conducted in either the targeted manner or the non-targeted manner. 
uh, targeted mannering in uh, uh, the attacker uh, wants to uh, mislead the trained model uh, to uh, make, make wrong predictions into the specific uh, target label. And for the non-targeted attack, so the attacker just aims to compromise the system integrity. Uh, so which means the AI models can make mistakes in, in the arbitrary manner. Uh, and for different domains, so we will touch on uh, the image data, graph data, and the text data. Uh, so here are some examples. Uh, for example, uh, here is a social network. So the attackers can inject some fake, uh, fake users in, into the social analysis graph. And similarly, for the uh, uh, text prediction uh, task, so the attackers can uh, modify some uh, words, characters uh, in the sentence uh, in such a way uh, so the NLP system uh, can miss, uh, uh, classify, um, mispredict the, uh, um, uh, the sentiment. Of, in this case, it's the sentiment analysis uh, task can uh, misclassify the uh, sentence into from the positive into the negative and similarly uh, the, uh, this serious problem happened during the video recognition system for example the original video uh, has some uh, copyright uh, claim but however if the attacker uh, just inserts a short clip into the original video uh, so the attacker can uh, evade the uh, copyright detection system uh, in particular, uh, so uh, adversary attacks uh, can not only exist uh, in the traditional machine learning uh, models such as the SVM or decision tree models. So adversary attacks can also uh, uh, exist in the uh, current deep learning models such as the convolution neural network, recurrent neural network, uh, graph neural network, transformers, and the generative networks. Uh, let's next turn to the adversary defense. Uh, so for adversary defense, um, uh, there are a lot of adversary defense mechanisms, including but not limited to the adversary training, uh, robust optimization, uh, so certified robustness, and provable uh, robustness uh, with theoretical robustness guarantees and also the adversary example detections and the data pre-processing uh, mechanisms. Uh, we will um, uh, talk more about this part uh, in the next uh, uh, few uh, slides. But before going on, uh, let's uh, first uh, uh, delve into more details about the adversary attack. Uh, here is the process of how to craft the adversary examples for uh, cat images. For example, uh, so uh, here is the original image, uh, which is recognized as a type cat with 95% by the AI model. However, by adding a small amount of the calculated noise, uh, so the AI models can misrecognize the original type cat into the strawberry. Uh, with 99% uh, of the confidence. Uh, depending on the knowledge of the attackers, so the adversary attack can be recognized into the white box attack and the black box attack. Uh, here are some, uh, here is the goal for the white box attack. Uh, so uh, given the test example X and its true label Y, and suppose the attacker knows the uh, model with parameter theta. Uh, so the attacker aims to find this uh, delta, uh, this noise, such that uh, if the noise is added to the original uh, test data X, so the model will misrecognize it uh, as the other uh, labels rather than the original true label. Uh, uh, it should be noted that the added noise uh, should uh, under should follow some constraints, uh, uh, such as the following listed constraint. Uh, some uh, norm uh, the norm is higher bounded by epsilon, or maybe some other constraint such as the similarity based me uh, measurements. 
uh, in terms of the uh, representative white box attacks, so uh, uh, there are some well-known uh, white box attacks such as the uh, fast gradient sign method, which is short for FTSM. So the projected gradient descent, which is short for the PTD attack and the CW attack. Uh, the objective function uh, for this different white box uh, attacks. Uh, so there are some similarities, but the operations of, for those different white box attacks are totally different. As you may see, uh, for uh, for their shared objectives, so uh, both of uh, all these white box attacks, so they aim to maximize the loss functions uh, under the constraint of the bounded LP norm of the added noise. However, uh, for the FDSM, uh, so uh, you can see uh, from these right top figures, so FDSM is a very fast uh, white box attack. Uh, it only requires one step gradient ascent to, to find the bad noise. Uh, however, the PDD attack will be conducted in an uh, iterative manner. Uh, for the CW attack, CW attack, uh, so it aims to uh, find some more invisible and harder to attack, harder to detect, to, to detect uh, uh, noise to be added to the test examples in order to make the models to uh, make uh, um, make wrong predictions. Uh, after uh, the white box attack, so we turn to the black box attack. Uh, as you may know, uh, in real world, uh, the uh, model architecture and the uh, model parameters are generally unknown as a prior right. Uh, so uh, given this is the most strict, uh, stricter uh, scenario. Uh, so how to calculate the perturbation uh, in order to mislead the AI models? So this is a very challenging problem. Um, in terms of how to achieve the adversary attack in the black box setting, so uh, there is a typical way to achieve this goal. Uh, so. Uh, it can be uh, launched into two steps. The first step is to train a substitute model followed by the gradient estimation. Uh, in terms of the substitute model, uh, so it, it is highly relevant to the transferability of adversary examples. Uh, so which means given the original uh, model A, uh, so uh, we want to, because we know the model A, so we can uh, uh, draft some, uh, adversary examples to uh, make model A to um, misclassify the uh, original, uh, the perturbed image as the other uh, uh, labels. For example, the model A uh, already uh, classified uh, the perturbed image of this cat into other labels, uh, so it's wrong. Uh, so the purpose of the transfer transferability of adversary examples is that uh, given the a black box model B. Uh, so we still uh, want the model B to make the wrong prediction on the perturbed image. So this is the so-called the transferability of adversary attacks. So after we uh, change the substitute model B, uh, uh, so we can, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so follow, for following the previous slide, so after we change the substitute model uh, by uh, conducting uh, several steps, for example, so we can synthesize the data set for training the black box, for training the substitute model, or we can uh, uh, choose some model architectures based on the uh, hands-on task. Uh, then uh, we can uh, draft some, we, we can do the gradient estimation based on the substitute model. Uh, so the way to estimate the gradients can be conducted in uh, several uh, SOTA methods. So one representative method is called a uh, zoo attack, so which is sought for the uh, zeros order optimization. Uh, so here is a, a figure to show how to conduct the estimate, uh, how to conduct the gradient estimation. Uh, uh, however, there are some weaknesses of the traditional attack. Uh, so for example, uh, so the hyperparameters are usually unfixed. Uh, 
Uh, so there are some constraints for the perturbation and also uh, it requires a lot of uh, computation resource to conduct the iterative optimization process. Uh, and also, uh, so, uh, so the uh, traditional adverse, for example, uh, searching uh, the process is very uh, um, imprecise. For example, uh, so it can be easily uh, evaded by using the gradient masking. So this is one type of the uh, defense mechanism against the adverse, for example. So we will uh, introduce this one uh, later. Um, but based on this weakness, there are uh, several SOTA attack, uh, for example, so the auto attack, which is an ensemble attack, um, integrating four different uh, attacks together, uh, uh, including the APGDC, APGDDLR, FAB, and the square attack. As you can see from uh, these uh, four attacks, so the auto attack, uh, so it can not only solve the gradient vanishing problems, but also considers uh, both the white box attack and the black box attack. Um, in such a way, so the auto attack can be taken as a more reliable robustness evaluation and a more stronger attack compared to the traditional um, FTSM, PGD, and the CW attack, as you can see from this figure. So um, given different uh, adversary uh, uh, defense mechanisms such as the AT chase, MART, or RST. So the auto attack is a more robust uh, adversary attack compared to the PGD and the CW attack. Uh, so uh, after we introduced several uh, adversary attacks and in either the white box manner and the black box manner. So the next uh, naive problem is that how can we protect uh, uh, the system against the vulnerabilities of the uh, adversary examples. Uh, so we turn to the adversary defense chapter. Uh, in terms of the adversary attack, uh, so uh, three typical uh, ways to achieve this goal includes uh, um, gradient uh, masking, uh, adversary training, and certified or called provable defense. Uh, let's first get started with the mm, gradient masking. Uh, what is gradient masking? So usually, usually the defense is said to be uh, uh, can cause the gradient masking phenomenon uh, if it doesn't have the useful gradients for generating the uh, useful uh, adverse examples. Uh, so uh, gradient masking can be achieved uh, by different manners, such as uh, shattering the gradients. So, which can be caused by uh, making the uh, making the model uh, non differentiable, uh, and also it can be achieved by the stochastic gradients, which can be caused by the randomization. Uh, similarly, gradient masking can be achieved by uh, gradients exploding and vanishing uh, by uh, modifying the uh, loss functions and by um, using uh, deeper uh, networks. Uh, next, the uh, typical way, and also uh, still a uh, very popular way to defend against adversary examples is called adversary training. Uh, so the goal of adversary training is uh, that the defender tries to change the model to minimize the empirical adversary risk. So the loss function is formulated as this bi-level optimization problem. So given the model uh, f uh, with parameter theta and the test data x and its true label y, uh, so in the inner loop, so here is the inner uh, maximization problem. So this max inner maximization problem aims to find the optimal uh, delta uh, under the constraint of the LP norm uh, bounded by this small epsilon. And for, for the outer uh, minimization problem, uh, so the defender aims to update the model parameter, this is theta, uh, in order to minimize the loss value on the um, perturbed images in order to maintain high uh, robust accuracy and clean accuracy. So this is the 
typical uh, procedure uh, for conducting the advisory training. Uh, however, uh, so uh, the traditional way to conduct the advisory training also has some limitations. Uh, it has been validated that the advisory training can only achieve the limited robustness empirically. Uh, but giving uh, giving more powerful uh, attacks, uh, such as the adaptive attacks. Uh, so uh, it's important to ask uh, the question, uh, how can we um, build a defense mechanism uh, that can be guaranteed to be safe? Uh, so uh, following this question, so uh, here comes up the uh, uh, certifying the robustness or the provable robustness. And one of the most important uh, uh, stream is called randomized smoothing. Uh, so here is an example of uh, how to conduct the randomized smoothing. Uh, uh, the goal, the main goal of the randomized, randomized smoothing is to guarantee the robustness in a bounded neighborhood. And it can uh, help achieve a smoother classifier and also proved to be robust in a certain radius. And here is the procedure during the training phase. So the randomized smoothing first uh, um, can, can first generate some uh, key samples with the Gaussian noise. And then the uh, defender will change the models with the augmented noisy samples. And during the prediction phase, Giving the test uh, example X, and uh, uh, then the defender can also generate an uh, Gaussian noise to create an uh, um, uh, noisy samples. And for each noisy um, test samples, so the model will give a prediction label C, and then the defender will, count, will count the prediction labels and find the most frequent one to assign as the prediction. So here is the basic procedure uh, during the training phase and the prediction phase for the randomized smoothing. Uh, usually the randomized smoothing will have some theoretical uh, proofs to validate that the, um, that the defense uh, mechanism by using the randomized smoothing can be uh, provably safe against the adversary examples. Mm, it should be also noted that uh, the adversary attack and the adversary defense, uh, so it's always a arm race game. Uh, so the attacker aims to uh, craft more powerful adversary attacks, um, for example, by um, crafting the adaptive adversary attacks. And the defender aims to uh, propose more powerful adversary defense mechanisms to defend against the different adversary attacks. Um, next, let's turn to the robustness in other domains, such as the graph domain and the text domains. Uh, so here are some examples for the graph attack. So there are also different types of the modifications for graph data in order to uh, craft the uh, adversary examples against the graph. For example, so the attacker can add an edge. Uh, you can see the first uh, Figure. So uh, the uh, attacker can add an edge between the node uh, two and eight. Uh, similarly, so the attacker can delete an um, uh, existing edge. For example, so the attacker can delete the edge between uh, the node of seven and uh, eight. Uh, so the attacker can also uh, rewire, re rewiring the nodes. For example, so the attacker can remove the link between seven and eight, and also adding a new edge between the node of three and eight. So the attacker can also uh, inject a new node into the uh, existing graph, uh, which is called the node injection, and also by creating some fake links between the uh, fake node and also the existing node. Uh, so the attacker can also uh, modify the features of the existing node in the graph. Uh, so uh, similarly, so the adversary attack in the graph domain can be uh, launched either in the uh, targeted manner or the untargeted manner. Uh, 
depending on the objective of the attacker. Uh, in terms of the how to defend against the adversary examples in the graph, uh, so there are typically uh, three ways to achieve this goal, uh, including the adversary training, uh, so graph purification and attention mechanisms. Um, so we have introduced the adversary training also beforehand. Uh, so uh, let's uh, next uh, briefly introduce how to achieve the graph purification. Uh, so uh, there is one paper uh, called uh, Protein, uh, so which introduced these uh, fancy mechanisms. Uh, as you can see from this figure, so after the uh, graph, graph learning, and then we can do the GN training based on the clean graph. So the objective is uh, that the defender aims to recover the clean graph uh, by uh, leveraging some uh, graph properties, such as the low ranking sparsity and the face smoothness. Uh, in terms of the text attack, so there is a, a, a key difference between the attacks against the text and also the uh, images. This is because the text uh, uh, data has some uh, inherent properties, such as the input is discrete and the modifications can be easily perceivable. And also by uh, maybe changing a character, a word, or maybe a sentence, and then the whole semantic meaning of the sentence will be changed as well. So here is an example for the adversary attack in the text domain. So as you can see from uh, uh, these two examples, actually the original text is recognized as a word. But however, if you are just modifying, by simply modifying uh, a character uh, by uh, changing original D, uh, uh, into P and also by changing the original P into this um, uppercase B, uh, then the uh, meaning of the whole sentence uh, will be changed totally. Uh, in terms of the defense mechanisms against the uh, text, uh, so uh, there are typically two ways to achieve this goal, including the data augmentation. Uh, so the defender can change the um, more robust uh, text models uh, based on the augmented data. Uh, also, the defender can uh, regu regularize the AI model uh, to conduct the adversary training. Uh, next, uh, let's turn to the real world adversary attacks. So the adversary attack not only exists in the digital world, it, it is also prevalent in the physical world. So for example, uh, by wearing some uh, adversary glasses, so the points in the AI system will be um, mislead, will, will become misleading as well. So for example, those two, uh, those two guys, so if they wear the, uh, some physical, um, physical kit, so th this is a physical world adversary example. So the points in the face recognition system will misrecognize these two guys into the uh, another target person. Uh, however, this uh, physical world adversary example, uh, it should be a, a concrete uh, case. There, they should follow some concrete uh, uh, patterns rather than the, um, some rankings, for example. So similar, still these two persons. So if they will the rankings, uh, so the face recognition system will can, can still, can still uh, uh, correctly uh, misclassify uh, their original faces. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, so the, uh, so the uh, attackers can craft some adversary t-shirt so the person uh, who wears this adversary t-shirt can evade the um, uh, recognition from the face recognition system. Uh, for example, in the video surveillance scenario, uh, so given this uh, person wearing this adversary t-shirt, so the object detection uh, AI system can, cannot, can, cannot even uh, correctly classify this person as a person. Uh, similarly, so the cap with this adversary mark 
can be misrecognized into other items in the smartest, uh, maybe in the smart recall scenario. Uh, so the um, AI system uh, for the self-checkout uh, um, smart retail can misrecognize uh, this cup may to, maybe into another uh, cheaper or maybe another more expensive items. Uh, this will cause some financial loss for the customers or um, for the um, smart retails as well. Uh, similarly, for the uh, uh, smart in the smart city, so the stop sign can be um, can be made into some uh, adversary examples. Uh, for example, so the original uh, AI model deployed in the autonomous driving car, so it can uh, correctly uh, classify this stop sign with ninety ninety uh, percent of the confidence. However, uh, giving uh, the Wall Street stop sign, uh, so the AI system uh, will misrecognize it as a sports for with 80% of the confidence. Uh, there are more uh, concrete examples in the smart uh, city, uh, in the smart uh, self-driving system. For example, so the attackers can put some graffitis on the real stop signs and it can also uh, put some dirty uh, road patterns on the real world, uh, in the real world. And also the stop sign uh, hiding and appealing attacks can mislead the self-driving uh, AI systems as well. Uh, next, let's turn to the uh, adversary training service and choose uh, to support uh, researchers to conduct the research in terms of the adversary uh, robustness. So here are some representative services for the adversary training. And here are the, some popular tools for the adversary training, uh, including but not limited to the clever hands, uh, deep robust um, adversary to touch and uh, robust bench. Uh, in particular, so the deep robust uh, uh, this PyTorch library is developed by MSU, uh, led by a Professor Ji Liang Tang. Uh, so here is a brief um, uh, look out for the uh, deep robust. Uh, so this uh, package includes uh, both the attack methods and defense methods uh, for two uh, representative domains, uh, including the um, image domain and the graph domain. And it, could, it can also support the different architectures and uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, finally, let's turn to the future directions. For future directions, there are a lot of uh, future directions in, in terms of the adverse robustness, um, including but not limited to the, uh, the uh, following points. So the first point is about the unsatisfying the robust performance of the adversary training. So currently there is still a large gap between the adversary robustness uh, and the clean and the clean accuracy. So in a real system, so the defenders, so the industry uh, companies always want both uh, uh, high clean accuracy and high robust accuracy. Uh, also, there is a gap between the uh, training data uh, robust accuracy and the test data robust accuracy. So this is the so-called robust general, generalization gap. Uh, and also it's quite interesting to uh, investigate the adversary robustness under multiple types of the attack, uh, not just limited to the current uh, attacks. And also, um, um, it's worthwhile to investigate uh, the adversary attacks on the last scale data sets. Uh, so a lot of researchers um, uh, just uh, conduct the adversary attack experiments on the, for the image uh, domain, so like the Sephardton data set. But uh, how it works on a larger scale data sets remains a very, a very challenging problem. And also it's, quite important to investigate the, uh, some uh, intersections between different uh, uh, perspectives. For example, um, whether there is some fairness issues under the adversary attack. And also, uh, 
it always requires more efficient probable defense mechanisms because current probable defense mechanisms is very uh, computationally um, expensive. Uh, so uh, this is pretty end of the uh, safety and the robustness part. So uh, let's welcome Wen Qi for the next chapter, uh, which is relevant for the explainability. Oh, thank you for me, Jen. So in this part, uh, I will be introducing the trustworthy AI uh, from its explainability perspective. And I am Wen Qi Fan from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, first, uh, you may have already know the AI technique have, have, have been widely used in many uh, real world applications, right? Especially in many uh, critical systems like the transportation, finance, uh, securities, and medicines, and so on. And despite their great performance, right, it's still very challenging to build trustworthy AI systems because uh, they are usually uh, treated as black box and they lack the human intelligible explanations. Here, uh, first, uh, let's look at a uh, typical procedures on how to uh, how an AI model works. Here, uh, we have the training data, right? We fish uh, them into an AI model. Say uh, we can use the deep neural networks, right? to train an algorithm, then uh, given uh, an input, the image, we can output the score of the predicted label. Here, this is a cat with 93% uh, uh, confidence. So in, mo in most cases, uh, these AI systems here are treated as black box. Uh, since most uh, deep uh, learning uh, models are too complicated and to be understanding, so uh, they are they also developed uh, without uh, considering the explainability. So uh, you may query uh, the decisions uh, made by the AI systems, like uh, why did uh, this AI system do that, and why not uh, something else, right? And also uh, when do uh, these AI systems uh, fail, uh, and and so on. So. Uh, actually, uh, for different uh, users, probably we can have different requirements on these explanations. For example, uh, uh, probably for the business owner, they may care about uh, whether the decisions can be trusted. Or for the system designers, they, uh, they are more interested in how do they monitor and debug the, uh, the proposed AI model. And for the AI, for the AI data science, uh, they uh, they may want to know is this the best model they they can be developed, right? So, uh, building a trustworthy AI system require understanding on how these uh, particular decisions are made, and without uh, understanding and verifying the inner uh, working mechanisms in this AI system. The AI systems uh, cannot be fully trusted, and it also prevents their use in many uh, critical applications regarding to the fairness, uh, privacy, and safety. So, and ideally, uh, the AI model uh, sh should have very high levels on the learning performance. Right, that means uh, we need to have very uh, high uh, prediction accuracy as well as uh, we, we, it can uh, produce explanation uh, on the predictions. In, so in these scenarios, uh, different users can probably can understand uh, why and why not and when for these predictions uh, by the AI models. Okay, um, are, there, are there other benefits to make explanations uh, to AI on the AI systems? The answer is yes. So if you know how and what your AI system are working, uh, you can understand the weakness of the classifier and also then uh, try to improve your model, right? For example, here, uh, this AI 
model may misclassify and I will share an example from the dog to the strawberry. So if these AI model are in is playable, then the the explanations can help can help inspire these uh, black box systems and tell us why this AI model makes uh, such predictions and what features and this uh, AI model focus on, right? So in order to understand the weakness and detect this, I will show an example also can uh, bring our human intuition, uh, we need this explainability. Also, if uh, uh, you know what's going on, uh, you can verify uh, whether the AI systems uh, can work as expected, especially in some uh, critical applications like the self-driving and medic uh, medical system. Uh, these are very important uh, because uh, the wrong uh, decisions can uh, cause me and dangerous, right? Okay. Uh, besides, uh, we also want to, we also uh, can learn from the AI system. Uh, like in the uh, Go game, I believe a lot of you have already uh, know that uh, the AlphaGo, right, uh, has already patterned uh, our human professional players. Fan Hui in probably in uh, 2015, Fan Hui said that uh, it's not a human move. Uh, it's I never uh, thought uh, a human place uh, this move, right? So if we can understand why the AI take this action, uh, probably we can become uh, better uh, good players, right? Okay. Uh, here is the outline uh, for explainable AI in this presentation. So uh, first I will introduce the concepts and taxonomy regarding the explainable uh, AI. First, uh, regarding the definition of explainable AI, uh, we prefer to use these following uh, definitions, the degree to which a human can understand uh, the cause of a decision. So in general, um, the higher the explainability of an AI system is, the easier it is for someone to comprehend on how certain decisions uh, ha have been made. Also, uh, a model is better explainable than other models. If, if its decisions are easier for our human to comprehend than those uh, from the others. And another thing is uh, while in interpretable AI and in its 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 tenable AI are are closely related, and some uh, subtle difference between them are discussed in some studies. So actually, in general, a model is interpretable if the model itself is uh, uh, capable of being understood by our human on its position. While on the other hand, the explainable uh, model uh, means the additional explanations uh, techniques are needed to help our human understand why it may search a certain prediction. And know that uh, these, uh, these models are still black box. And such example for this uh, kind of uh, technique uh, will be our deep neural network based model. Here uh, we group this explanation uh, technique for AI systems according to different uh, criteria. Here uh, we mainly group uh, this explanation technique into three categories based on uh, the model usage and the methodologies as well as the explanation scope. So uh, in this part, uh, we will introduce some representative explanation techniques according to the taxonomy. So the first uh, category uh, we are going to introduce is based on the model usage. Here, if explanations uh, depend on the model architecture, 
and achieved by the model design. And we call this kind of method as the model intrinsic explanations. Actually, uh, this model is white box. In it, it was it already uh, well, uh, well explainable. So on the other hand, the uh, post hoc explanations are developed to explain the target uh, AI, AI models uh, after this uh, AI model well training. So in this kind of methods, explainable uh, can be achieved by using additional uh, methods. And actually uh, these uh, post hoc methods can also be applied to other uh, AI models. So in general, uh, there, are, there are many research uh, topics in developing the post hoc methods to explain the predictions of existing uh, deep neural network technique. Uh, so uh, the intrinsic explanations uh, is often called the transparent or the white box explanation. In general, uh, this kind uh, of interpretable technique uh, cannot be reused by other classifier architecture. So uh, this, uh, therefore, uh, this kind of um, methods are uh, model intrinsic. And some uh, widely used uh, uh, model uh, is like the linear model or the decision tree or the rule-based model. Uh, they belong to uh, this category. For example, uh, as one of the most representative model in AI, the linear regression model aims to predict the target as the weighted sum of the instant features right here. So uh, with this unlearnable uh, weight, the, this uh, linear regression model can make the prediction understandable on this uh, model level, right? So another uh, representative uh, method here is the decision tree. The interpretation of the decision tree is simple. Yeah, in this decision tree, the, the intermediate node in this tree uh, represents uh, the decision. And the leaf node is the class label. So making decision in this decision tree is also the procedures of explaining this uh, model. So it is seek by, uh, it's try to uh, seek the path from the row, uh, the row nodes to the leaf node. And different from the uh, model intrinsic explanations, the post hoc explanations focus on the uh, black box and the well trained AI system. In general, uh, such uh, methods uh, do not try to uh, create interpretable models, but it try to explain already routing and decide model. And such uh, methods are widely used to explain the complicated uh, methods like the deep learning, right? So uh, the great advantage of uh, this uh, post hoc explanation methods is their flexibility. So what, what does it mean? And uh, uh, these uh, post hoc methods can be widely applied in uh, different AI mod models or different input uh, data, such as the image test or the graph structure data and so on. And here, uh, one of the most uh, represented work in this uh, subcategory is the NIME. Uh, so for the uh, local interpretable model uh, analysis explanations. The main idea of this method is uh, try to generate the explanations by approximating uh, the black box model and by uh, using uh, the interpretable uh, linear model and change on the perturbations of the original instance. So the key iteration behind the name is it's much easier for, uh, for us to approximate the uh, black box model by using a simple uh, model uh, locally like the interpretable uh, linear model 
or the decision tree. So uh, the goal here is try to maximize this following objective. F here is the original breadboard model, like the deep neural network. And G here is a solar gate model. Uh, we use the linear regression, right? Uh, linear uh, classification. Or, so the, the, this first, the first term, term here is to uh, approximate this breadboard model F by learning a uh, solar gate model G here. And it's also weighted uh, by this kernel function. This kernel function is a proximity measure to define the localities around the S. And the second term uh, is to measure the uh, complexity of the explanation model. Okay, so how does this line work? Uh, okay, suppose that uh, we want to uh, explain a classifier. This classifier predicts that this image as the uh, tree uh, fork, right? So first uh, we take this image on the left and divide it into interpretable components. It is a uh, contiguous uh, superficials, right? And then uh, we generate a data set of this uh, pattern instance by uh, turning uh, some of the interpretable component off. Here, uh, we, in this case, uh, we made uh, them grid. And then we can calculate or and get this uh, probability of this perturbed instance according to the uh, breadboard model F, right? We have this uh, probability on this perturbed instance. Uh, next, uh, we can uh, use this data uh, to learn this surrogate uh, linear model on this uh, data set and which is uh, locally weighted. So in the end, we just present uh, the superficials with highest uh, positive weight on this uh, so, uh, perturbed instance as the uh, explanations. Next, uh, let's uh, look at the second category for explanations. Uh, so uh, this category is uh, mainly defined by answering the question. Uh, that is the focus on input, uh, data input uh, instance or the change of the input data. So uh, we can categorize uh, the explanations and methods as the gradient-based explanations. And these methods focus on the gradients of the target predictions regarding input instance. While the perturbation-based explanations focus on the change or the modifications of the input instance. Okay, uh, if first in the gradient-based methods, uh, the explainable algorithms do one or more uh, forward pathings uh, through these uh, blackboard models, and then generate these attributes, attributions during the back propagation uh, step. So in this slide, uh, we try to understand how CNN model made decisions. In general, uh, we know a typical uh, CNN model uh, is uh, stacked uh, some convolutional layers and followed by uh, a lot of uh, fully connected layers, right? So here uh, we introduce a very representative explanation and methods called a class activation mapping uh, to explain CNN. These uh, methods propose to first uh, modify the fully connected uh, layers in the original CNN architect uh, architectures by uh, using the global average pooling and then generate the input class specific regions of the image uh, for visual explanations via the forward pathing. Here, uh, this uh, global uh, average pooling average the iterations of the each feature map and concatenate uh, them as average and output them as a vector. Uh, then uh, it, it, it does a weighted sums of this uh, vector. So using this architecture, we can highlight the important regions on this uh, convolutional feature map. Here are some demo. Uh, we can see the CAM methods can produce the class specific regions of the target image 
for the visual explanations. And this area is good enough to uh, compute the contributions of the gradient for ASEAN predictions. And the second category in this uh, methodology is, is about the uh, perturbation explanation uh, methods. These methods uh, focus on variations in input features and to exploit the individual uh, feature attributions. It, it definitely, uh, they try to change the input and then observe the effect on the output. So in this slide, uh, we will introduce uh, this kind of uh, methods in the graph structure data. So in general, in graph domain, given the uh, graph with the node and the edge, right? Yeah, we want to note uh, which graph edge or nodes or the node features are the most important to affect the, the GNN's predictions. So uh, given this input graph, the explanations on the graph is try to identify a small subgraph here, right? Uh, uh, they are the most influential for the predictions. Here, a uh, representative uh, method is the GN explainer. It try to explain the, uh, the techniques of a GN uh, graph neural networks. They announce a soft map here, a soft map for the edge and all the node feature to explain the predictions uh, via the mass uh, optimization. Uh, this GNN explainer combine uh, this mass uh, with the original graph via this animal wise uh, multiplication. So uh, this mass uh, uh, optimizing by maximizing this mutual information between the predictions of the original graph and the predictions from the generated uh, subgraph. Okay, uh, let's uh, take a look at this result here. Here uh, is a graph uh, classification task. Uh, they start explanations on the molecular graph. Here in this example, color indicates the node uh, features and they represent the atoms the, the, like the high dragon or the uh, com, uh, carbon, right? So this gene explainers can identify the carbon ring structure and the chemical group, NO2, right? They are, these are, they are the most influential for the prediction. Next, uh, let, let's uh, move to the first uh, categories uh, regarding the scope of explanation technique. So if the, the methods uh, provide an explanation for a specific instance only, and we call it the local explanations, while if the methods is used to explain the whole uh, target model or a specific class, and we call it the global explanation. Let's have a look at the local explanation first. In general, uh, the the goal of uh, local explanation methods is to identify the individual feature attributions of a single input instance from the data population. Here, a representative uh, approach is science map. For example, in the image classification task, the science map uh, is the feature map. They can tell us the influences of the picture in the image based on the predicted results. So how to achieve this? The science map is to calculate the gradient of the uh, class score uh, corresponding to the input image. Here I is the input, uh, the image, and Y is the target uh, class. SYI is the predicted uh, scores on the image I for class Y given by the blue board model. So uh, we wish to solve this optimization problem and find the explanation image I star here. Okay. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the goal of global explanation is to uh, provide insights for model decisions as a whole and to 
uh, to have a global understanding about attributions for a batch of input data or certain label, not just for individual inputs. So in general, the global explanation methods uh, work on summarizing the overall behavior of the blackboard model. Yeah, uh, we still focus on the uh, global explanations on the uh, graph domain. Typically, given a well-trained uh, GM model, the global uh, network explanations aims to display uh, what graph uh, patterns and leads to a certain prediction. For example, uh, in graph domain, uh, one uh, possible pattern is uh, the notif, and different notif uh, can be found in the graph with different uh, functions, right? And it means uh, different motif may directly relate to the function of the graph and for the final prediction. So here uh, we introduce a method uh, called SGN to express GN graph neural networks as the global network. This approach can provide a high level insights and generic understanding on how GN work from a global view. So they, pro uh, they propose to display this GN by training a graph generator such that uh, the GN uh, work from uh, such that uh, the generated graph pattern can maximize a certain predictions of the model. And technically, uh, they formulate this, uh, this graph generation as a reinforcement learning task. And in each step, the graph generator predicts how to add one edge into this uh, current graph. And besides, they also uh, incorporate several graph rules to enhance this, uh, the generated graph. Here are some examples in molecular data sets for the uh, cl uh, graph classification. There are two uh, class label. They are, uh, they are multi uh, multigenic or non multigenic uh, This results show uh, explanations on non uh, mutagenic class. Here, here we can observe that uh, the combination of uh, a bromine and fluorine and the uh, chlorine and always uh, lead, lead to the, uh, the non mutagenic prediction. Uh, so uh, such observations indicate that the, the well-changed GN classifier uh, may uh, capture uh, this uh, key uh, graph patterns to make the prediction. And also uh, by, by analyzing such explanations, we can better understand how the, the well-changed GN work. Okay, in next part, uh, we will introduce some representative real-world applications by using the explainability. And uh, we may know that uh, in e-commerce, uh, good explanations uh, for recommended systems uh, uh, may increase customers' trust in the system and also help customers uh, make better decisions, also encourage them to interact with the products. So in general, uh, there are there are many widely used explanation methods in, in recommender systems, like uh, a frequently buy together, also will, buy uh, after will, also buy, and so on. Also, uh, so in this slide, a method integrates in inductions of explainable rules from the knowledge graph and build a role uh, guidance uh, recommendation methods. So they, how do they do? They first uh, uh, try to link the product by using the knowledge graph. And then they introduce the rule-based uh, learning model to use the relations in the uh, non items uh, knowledge graph for explanations. After that, uh, they can summarize some common rules patterns uh, from the item associations for explanations. Uh, here, uh, next, next example is from natural language processing uh, in the uh, healthcare domain. So 
if intelligible explanations are provided, a doctor, it's much better to make a decision with the help of AI models. Uh, for example, an AI model uh, predicts that a patient has the flu. At the same time, the explanations highlights that the, the things in this uh, patient's history uh, is the, uh, which can lead to the predictions, right? Uh, we can see that the sinus and the headaches and contributes to the uh, flu uh, predictions more. So with this, the doctors can make a better decisions about whether to uh, charge these uh, models predictions. Okay, uh, and now uh, let's uh, quickly go through some surveys and tools in this explorable AI. And some, uh, here are some survey. So if you uh, want to uh, know more about this topic, uh, you can refer to uh, this survey. Also, uh, there, there are some tools for explorable AI. So you can use it to explore your model, especially for uh, deep learning. In the uh, last slide, uh, I list some uh, potential future directions in explorable AI for trustworthy uh, AI systems. And since uh, the explorable AI is still in developing area, and many open uh, problems uh, need to be considered. First, uh, recent studies uh, have shown that uh, due to their data-driven uh, natural, explorable AI models are vulnerable uh, to adversarial attack. So what does it mean? Uh, it means uh, attackers uh, can uh, try to generate adversarial examples, uh, which uh, not only can mislead the target uh, AI systems, but also can manipulate its corresponding explanations. So it's very dangerous. So it naturally arises uh, some uh, potential security concerns on these explanations. Therefore, uh, how to defend against such adversarial attack on explanations will be a very important future directions. And second, it's still unclear how to uh, measure what is a, a good explanation in most of the current explanation technique. So it's a very important to I, I study some uh, evaluation matches for explanations. And third, uh, most uh, existing explanation techniques require to have a uh, full knowledge of the target uh, AI systems, right? So, uh, however, uh, knowledge uh, regarding these target AI systems is often limited in many scenarios because of the uh, pr uh, privacy and security concerns. So, an important direction probably is uh, to understand how an uh, explanation can be generated in the black box setting. Okay, and this is all for explainabilities for trustworthy AI. So uh, I will uh, hold, hand over this tutorial to Hao Chen. Hao Chen. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Wenxi. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, so hello everyone. I'm Hao Chen Liu from Michigan State University. In this section, I'm going to introduce the fourth dimension, uh, non-discrimination and fairness. A trustworthy AI system should avoid discriminatory behaviors and ensure fairness when interacting with humans. However, uh, recently there is much evidence showing that AI systems can show human human-like discrimi uh, discri discriminatory bias or make unfair decisions. For example, uh, the online AI chatbot Tay, developed by Microsoft, produced a lot of improper racist and sexist comments, uh, which eventually led it to be shut down within 24 hours after release. In addition to producing improper speech, recent uh, research also shows that 
product models can be biased towards different groups. In fact, uh, when talking about females and African-Americans, dialogue models tend to generate more offensive responses and more responses with negative sentiments. For example, given a context, if we simply change the pronoun in it from he to she, a dialogue model can generate very different responses. And the response generated for females is more negative. The fairness issues also exist in other AI applications. In recent years, uh, AI has been applied by cause in recidivism prediction tasks. Cause use uh, an AI system to evaluate the risk that a prisoner to commit a crime again, and then decide who can be released. But people find that uh, the recidivism prediction software used by U.S. courts often assigns a higher risk score for, for an African American than a white American, even if they are uh, even if they have similar profiles. This causes the unfairness in judicial decision making. What's more, uh, in job recommendation tasks, a job recommendation system is found to promote more them employment opportunities to male candidates than to females. So it breaks the equality of opportunity between the two genders. Non-discrimination and fairness is a very important dimension that we have to consider to achieve trustworthy AI. Generally speaking, it involves uh, two aspects. First, uh, an AI system avoid this uh, AI, AI system avoid discriminatory behaviors in human machine interaction, such as the racist and sexist speech produced by the chatbots. Second, an AI system should ensure fairness in decision making. For example, don't use the race of a person as the evidence to evaluate his recidivism risk. In this part of the uh, presentation, I will, <coughs> sorry. Uh, in this part of the presentation, I will introduce the non-discrimination and fairness dimension on these topics. I will first introduce the concepts and definitions regarding bias and fairness in the context of AI and provide a detailed uh, taxonomy to discuss different origins of bias and different types of bias and fairness. Next, I will introduce specific bias issues in real world uh, AI systems. After that, I will present popular bias mitigation technologies for building fair AI systems. Then I will introduce some surveys and tools on AI fairness that can help the audience to get more detailed knowledge in this field. Finally, I will discuss the future research directions in this field. So let's begin with the concepts and taxonomy. In terms of bias, uh, I will first go through the definition of bias different sources of bias and the different types of bias. As for fairness, I will discuss the definition of fairness and different types of fairness. So the word bias conveys different meanings in different contexts, and it has been kind of, uh, kind of abused in the AI field. We first distinguish the concept of bias in our topic from that in other contexts. Uh, there are three categories of bias, productive bias, erroneous bias, and discriminatory bias. Productive bias exists in all machine learning algorithms. It is beneficial and necessary for an algorithm to work. The productive bias is introduced from our assumptions of the problem, such as the choice of a loss function, an assumed distribution, or an optimized, uh, optimization method, and so on. It can help the algorithm to solve so, uh, certain types of problems. Erroneous bias can be viewed as a systematic error caused by faulty assumptions. For example, we, we typically assume that the distribution of the training data is consistent with the real data distribution. But sometimes it is not true. The violation of our assumption can lead to the learned models uh, undesirable performance of the test data. And discriminatory bias is the kind of bias we are interested in 
under AI uh, non-discrimination and fairness. It reflects uh, algorithms unfair behaviors towards a certain group or an individual, such as producing discriminatory content for some people or performing less well for some people. In this presentation, all the bias we discuss is the discriminatory bias. The bias of an AI algorithm comes come from different sources. Each phase in the pipeline of building an AI system, including data annotation, data collection, data processing, and model fitting, can produce bias. In the phase of data annotation, bias can be introduced uh, due to a non a uh, non-representative group of annotators, uh, experienced annotators, uh, uh, a preconceived st stereotypes held by the annotators. In the face of uh, data collection, bias can emerge due to uh, the selection of data sources, or uh, how data from different sources are acquired uh, and prepared. In the data processing stage, bias can be generated due to data cleaning, data enrichment, and data aggregation. In the model fitting stage, the model training process may over amplify the bias existing in the training data, which leads to a more biased model. There are different types of bias. First, there is uh, explicit bias and implicit bias. The, ex uh, the explicit bias, also known as direct bias, occurs when the sensitive attribute explicitly causes an undesirable outcome. For example, in a recidivism model, if the race attribute of African American leads the model to assign a higher recidivism score, we can say the model has the implicit bias in terms of race. The, the implicit bias, also known as indirect bias, means that uh, an undesirable outcome is caused by non-sensitive and seemingly neutral attributes. But implicitly, the neutral attributes have potential associations with the sensitive attributes. For example, although the uh, residential address of a person seems to be a non-sensitive attribute, it can correlate with the race or nationality of a person. Because the, popularity, uh, because the population distribution of these uh, different groups is uneven. For example, in some places in the US, African Americans or Latinos tend to live together in certain communities. If a recidivism model is not provided with the race of an uh, African American, but is provided by his uh, residential address, the model may also learn to associate the address with a high risk score. In fact, the model associates a negative outcome for black people in an indirect way. But what's more, uh, language style is another neutral attribute that can lead to implicit bias. Actually, people from different uh, race, age, or nationality groups tend to have different language styles. For some algorithms in the text domain, even if they are able to infer the demographic uh, attribute based on its language, uh, sorry, I mean, for some algorithms in the text domain, even if they are not provided with the demographic information of the author of a text, they may also be able to infer the demographic attribute based on his language style and then learn an implicit bias for those groups. Second, there is acceptable, uh, acceptable bias and unacceptable bias. The acceptable bias, also known as explainable bias, means that uh, the discrepancy of outcomes for different individuals or groups can be reasonably explained by some factors. <laughs> for example, a salary estimation model may predict higher salaries for males than females. But actually, people find that this is because males work for a longer time per week than females. With this fact in mind, uh, we think the biased outcomes are acceptable and reasonable. 
the unacceptable bias, also known as uh, unexplainable bias, indicates the bias that cannot be explained appropriately. For example, uh, for male and uh, female employees with similar profiles, if a salary estimation model predicts a higher salary for the male and a lower salary for the female only because of their genders, this cannot be explained reasonably. This bias is unacceptable bias, which we try to uh, avoid in practice. In the context of AI, uh, fairness is formally defined as the absence of any prejudice and uh, favoritism towards an individual or group based on their intrinsic or acquired traits uh, in the context of decision making. In practice, there are typically two types of fairness, group fairness and individual fairness. Group fairness requires that two groups of people with different sensitive attributes receive comparable treatments and outcomes statistically. Based on this principle, uh, multiple definitions have been proposed, such as equal opportunity, equal oath, and demographic parity, and so on. Although group fairness can maintain fair outcomes for a group of people, a model can still be uh, discriminatory at the individual level. Individual fairness is based on the principle that uh, similar individuals should be treated similarly. A model satisfies uh, individual fairness if it gives similar predictions to similar individuals. Formally, if two individuals I and G are similar under uh, under a certain metric delta, the difference between the predictions given by an algorithm M on them should be small enough. So here D is the function that measures the distance between two individuals I and G. And FM is the predictive function that maps an individual to an outcome. And each genome you know, is a small constant to bound the difference. So next, I will introduce specific bias issues in real-world AI systems that have been investigated in recent research. We introduced the works following the order of different state domains, including tabular data, uh, image, images, uh, text, and audios. Each state domain involves several different tasks. For each domain, we describe one to two representative tasks and present how AI systems can be biased on these tasks. Tabular data is the most uh, common format of data in machine learning. So the research on bias and fairness in machine learning is initially conducted on such data. On tabular data, classification is the most uh, classical task where bias can be produced. Here, we take the recidivism prediction task as an example again. In the, uh, in a Recidivism task, uh, a classification model takes the profile information of a prisoner as the input and perform a binary classification to predict whether the prisoner has a high or low risk to reoffend. Based on one of the group fairness definitions, equalized odds, a fair classification model should satisfy this equation. In this equation, uh, Y indicates the real class Y hat indicates the predicted class, and A indicates the group attribute. This equation requires the probability of a person uh, in the positive class being correctly assigned a positive outcome should be the same for two groups. And also, the probability of a person in a negative class uh, being in incorrectly assigned a positive outcome should also be the same for the two groups. But in statistically, uh, but in statistics, African Americans are more likely to be uh, labeled uh, with high risk, but actually didn't reoffend. On the contrary, uh, white people are more likely to be labeled with low risk, but indeed reoffend. This result, this result violates the definition of uh, equalized odds, and it means that the prediction model is not fair. As for the image data, 
trace recognition is a popular application where gender bias and race bias often occurs. In this work, uh, the authors compared the performance of three classifiers on the gender classification task, where a classifier is asked to predict the gender of a person in an image. So in this table, DFDM LF LM stands for uh, darker skin female, darker skin male, lighter skin female, and lighter skin male, respectively. So by observing the table, we can see uh, the females typically get a significant higher error rate than males. And uh, darker skin people get a higher error rate than lighter skin people. Especially for darker skin females, we can see the face recognition model's performance is really poor. The huge violation on the performance for different groups indicates the unfairness of the classifiers. This phenomenon may be caused by the fact that there are a few more training instances of females and darker skinned people in the training data set. As for the text domain, a lot of works have, have shown that the bias exists in various NLP tasks. In the word embedding task, researchers found that uh, the word embeddings learned from large scale human corpus may contain some human like stereotypes. Specifically, uh, the word embeddings learned from the co occurrence information of the words have been proven to somehow encode the semantic information of the words. And there are some interesting analogy relations uh, can be found among the words. For example, the difference between the words men and women is similar to the difference between king and queen. This analogy relation is reasonable since it, it indicates that uh, king and queen describe the same thing with different genders. But people also find a similar analogy relation uh, on computer programmer and homemaker. We, uh, so this, implicitly indicates that men is more likely to be a computer programmer and a woman is more likely to be a homemaker. But these two uh, occupations should be gender neutral. So this reasonable analogy uh, relation causes the embeddings to be biased. If we define a uh, gender direction in the embedding space by calculating the difference between the embeddings of words she and he, we can project occupation words on this direction vector and see their gender uh, inclination. We can find that homemaker, nurse, they are very close to the female side. But uh, words like maestro, uh, architect, they are very close to uh, the male side, which also reflects the people's stereotype of the two genders. And in the right side, we list some analogies uh, that shows gender stereotypes. If we use these biased embeddings in downstream tasks, the bias is very likely to be inherited uh, or even uh, amplified then cause a biased outcome in the downstream NLP tasks. As for, as for the audio data, <clears throat> bias can be found in the speech recognition task. Recent studies show that uh, there is a significant gap between the performance of speech recognition models on the voice from different genders and different races. The left figure shows the performance comparison on Google's uh, speech recognition system in terms of gender. The experiment shows that in terms of the proportion of correctly recognized words, the system uh, performs significantly better on male voice than female voice. And the right figure shows the performance comparison on five popular speech recognition systems in terms of race. We can see that for all the systems, the audios from uh, white people get a lower average word error rate than those from black people, which demonstrates uh, unfairness for different race groups. 
So after knowing how real-world AI applications can be biased, next we will discuss the, the bias mitigation strategies. According to at which stage of training a machine learning model, we conduct the bias mitigation. The bias mitigation strategies can be categorized into three categories, pre-processing, in-processing, and post-processing. So the pre-processing methods aim to remove the bias in the training data, and the in-processing methods seek to eliminate bias during the model training process. And post-processing methods try to make trans transformations on the model's outputs to ensure fair final outcome. For each category of the bias mitigation methods, uh, we will briefly introduce the ideas of uh, each strategy. And we will take one strategy as an example to illustrate how it works. In the pre-processing category, we have a rebating, sampling, blinding, and relabeling for methods. The rebating method tries to assign a weight for each instance to mitigate the bias in data. It aims to up, upweight the training instance of unrepresented groups and downweight those of the overrepresented groups. And sampling seeks to create samples to correct training data and eliminate bias. For example, some works propose to adaptively sample the instances which are both diverse in features and fair to sensitive attributes for training. And blinding aims to make a, make a classifier immune to one or more sensitive variables. In other words, blinding methods try to make a classifier not sensitive to a protective variable. And relabeling tries to flip or modify the dependent variable, that is the label, uh, to mitigate the bias in data. For example, some works try to relabel the training data to make the proportion of positive instances are equal across all protected groups. And in the in-processing category, we have rebating, regularization, and adversarial learning methods. Uh, the rebating method in the in-processing category is similar to the rebating method in the pre-processing category. The difference is that uh, in the in-processing category, the weights for instances can be updated during training. And the regularization method tries to mitigate the bias of the model by adding penalty terms, which penalize the model for discriminatory practices. And the third strategy, adversarial learning, is now popular and also known as adversarial devising. It is used to force a model to focus on the non-sensitive features to do the prediction while ignoring the sensitive attributes. In the post-processing uh, category, we have thresholding, transformer, uh, transformation, and calibration. The thresholding methods try to adaptively determine threshold values for fairness purpose. And transformation learns a new representation of the data, often as a mapping or projection function in which fairness is ensured. And the calibration method aims to uh, calibrate the final out uh, outputs by matching the predictions with the training data. For example, a common strategy is to ensure that uh, the proportion of positive prediction uh, is equal to the proportion of positive examples in the training data. So after introducing the general ideas of different bias mitigation strategies, next let's uh, elaborate one of them. This work, uh, provides a simple but classical adversarial learning method to mitigate bias during training. Suppose that uh, for each instance, we have access to its, future, to its feature, X is label Y, uh, and a sensitive attribute Z of, the, of this instance. Uh, the adversarial learning method introduced an adversarial model to help the original model to get rid of the impacts of sensitive attributes. 
Suppose we want to learn a predict model uh, with Swift W, which takes the uh, feature X as input to predict the label Y. The feature X may explicitly or implicitly include a sensitive attribute such as gender or race of this instance, which may lead to a biased prediction. So to avoid the impact of sensitive attributes on the prediction, we try an adversary model with weight E to predict the sens sensitive attribute Z. To, to predict the sensitive attribute Z based on the outcome uh, from the predictor Y hat. In practice, to ensure that uh, the gradient can be propagated correctly, uh, the authors use the output layer of the prediction network as the input of the adversary network instead of uh, use the discrete, discrete prediction. So during training, the predictor and the adversary are trained alternatively. The adversary U is trained on a simple goal that minimizes the cross entropy loss uh, between Z and Z hat, which means to maximize the prediction accuracy of the sensitive attribute Z. And the predictor is trained with two, girl, uh, two goals. First, uh, minimize in the cross entropy loss between Y and Y hat in order to train the model to make accurate predictions on the original task. And second, uh, maximize the loss LA in order to prevent uh, the predictor to, e to extract the features that are associated with the sensitive attribute C. And when we update the predictor's weight W, uh, we add the second term here, the, the gradient of LP onto the gradient of LA to prevent the predictor from moving in a direction that helps the adversarial U decrease its loss. So in this way, we can train a predictor model on the original prediction task while getting rid of the impact of the sentiment uh, of the sensitive attribute Z on the prediction task. The next I will present the surveys and tools. In this slide, uh, we list several survey papers that summarized research works in the field of AI fairness. We suggest the audience to check these surveys to get more detailed knowledge in this field. So in the first survey, uh, 50 years of test fairness, lessons for machine learning, the authors trace the evolution of the notions and measurements of fairness in different fields such as education and hiring over the past 50 years. And in the second survey, uh, a survey on measuring indirect discrimination in machine learning, the authors provide an early uh, overview on measuring indirect discrimination in machine learning. In the third survey, uh, the measures and means measure of fairness, a critical review of fair machine learning uh, it provides a critical review on the measurements of fairness. In this survey, the authors show the limitations of the existing fairness criteria in classification tasks in machine learning. And in the fourth and fifth uh, surveys, a survey on bias and fairness in machine learning and fairness in machine learning a survey. Uh, there are two comprehensive surveys in this field. They provide a detailed taxonomy of the bias and fairness definitions and summarize the, the SOTA debiasing approaches for building fair machine learning models. And the last survey, bias and debias in recommendation systems, a survey and future direction. It summarizes and organizes the, the works on bias and debias in recommender systems and discuss future directions in this field. And recently, some organizations or individual researchers provide some toolkits to facilitate fair AI. The repository uh, responsibly collects the data set and measurements for evaluating bias and fairness in classification and NLP tasks. The project Fair Test uh, provides a framework to discover unfair user treatment in data driven algorithms. And uh, AIF360 
collects popular datasets for finite study and provides implementation of common devising methods for binary classification. And the, the fourth uh, toolkit is released as an audit toolkit to test the bias and fairness of models for multiple demographic groups on different metrics. And the last one, the repository fairness measurements provides datasets and codes for quantitatively measuring discrimination in classification and ranking tasks. So uh, finally, I will discuss the future directions in this field. The research on AI fairness still face some challenges in the current stage. Here we discuss uh, set three potential future directions. First, uh, studies on AI fairness have confirmed the existence of trade-off between fairness and performance of an uh, algorithm. Since both fairness and performance are important, more research is needed to help people better understand an uh, algorithm's trade-off mechanism between fairness and performance so that developers can adjust the balance between them in practical usage based on their actual demand. Second, although many research works study bias and fairness in AI, many of them formulate their problems under a weak bias concept, which refers to any uh, refers to any harmful system behaviors to humans, but fail to provide a precise definition of bias or fairness that is specific to their study. For any fairness problem to study, researchers should provide a precise concept and make it clear uh, how, to whom, and why an algorithm can be harmful. In this way, we can make the research on AI fairness in the whole community uh, more standardized and systematic. And third, uh, fairness definitions are often associated with equality to ensure that individuals or groups are given similar treatments and opportunities. But, uh, but equity has been not fully investigated. The notion of equity indicates that each individual or group should be given the resources they need to succeed. Equity is an interesting uh, future direction and it may extend or contract it or contract it contradict, it may extend or contradict the existing definitions of fairness in, in machine learning. So this is the end of the section of non-discrimination and fairness. Next, let's welcome Jamal Kun to introduce the next dimension, environmental well-being. Hi, right, thank you. All right, can everyone see my, see my screen? Yes. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Jamal. Um, next, I'm going to introduce the fifth dimension, the environmental well-being. So here, as we have introduced before, a trustworthy AI system should not be, should not damage the ecological environment on the earth. Uh, but recently, some studies have shown that the development of AI technology can indeed challenge the, te the tense global situations of energy shortage and environmental deterioration. So a recent study has shown that developing large NLP models can bring a huge burden on energy consumption, which negatively affects the environment. So this table shows the carbon emissions of training these NLP models and it compares it with the carbon emissions of some daily usages. Uh, note that the amount of carbon dioxide emissions is typically used as an indicator of the energy consumption. We can see that the training and tuning, we can see that training and tuning a common NLP pipeline produces more than 78,000 pounds of carbon dioxide, which is a great deal. Um, which is just as much as the amount a human can produce in seven years, which is terrible, by the way. Uh, what's more is if we compare these two terms, we can find training and fine-tuning fine a large transformer model costs five times 
more energy consumption than a car in its entire lifetime. Given that some AI models have a huge energy consumption and can threaten the environment, it is necessary for us to take the environmental impacts into consideration when designing AI systems. So in terms of environmental well-being, we wish a trustworthy AI system to satisfy two principles. It must be sustainable and environmentally friendly. So let's talk about the first point. So sustainability. So sustainability requires the AI system to consume limited resources in its development and deployment so that it can be used repeatedly and benefit the human society in a sustainable manner. Uh, the second point, uh, environmentally friendly. So an environmentally friendly AI system is required not to produce byproducts that pollute the environment, such as carbon dioxide. Uh, current research on the environmental well-being of AI systems mainly focus on their energy consumption. Energy consumption involves both these two principles that we just mentioned. Specifically, energy consumption directly determines whether an AI system is sustainable. Also, a huge consumption is also accompanied by a lot of carbon emissions, which also does a lot of harm for the environment. So in this section of the presentation, we will focus on the studies on energy consumptions of AI systems and focus more on sustainability and environmentally friendly ways that we can ensure this. So in this section, uh, I will first introduce several energy consumption estimation studies for AI applications in different fields. And then I will present several state-of-the-art techniques for reducing energy consumptions. Um, then lastly, I would introduce some surveys and tools in these topics and later discuss the future directions. So first, let's begin with the energy consumption estimation. So since in the computer vision domain, this process proposes a framework named neural power to predict the power, runtime, and energy of a CNN model. Uh, this prediction framework takes the CNN architecture as well as the target platform where the CNN model will be deployed <clears throat> and as the input learns a polynomial regression model to predict its power, runtime, and energy consumption. So this framework can be used in such a machine learning pipeline. The machine learning developers first designed a CNN model and inputs the information and the platform, uh, the inf inputs the information and the platform information into neural power to get an estimation of its energy consumption. And then based on these predictions, adjust the model and adjust the CNN model. So in the field of NLP, this work compares the carbon emissions of training popular or well-known NLP models on different types of hardware. So we can see that some large NLP models don't only consume a large amount of power energy, but also have a high cloud compute course, cost. By the way, the high cost of training such large scale models also prevent individual researchers to contribute to this field, which is also really bad for the de development and deployment of uh, sustainable and environmentally friendly AI models. So next, we can go through the energy consumption reduction methods. So Existing studies on reducing energy consumption of AI models mainly try to solve this problem in three ways. The first, model compression. Model compression aims at 
reducing the size of deep models via some model compression techniques to save energy. The second, adaptive design. Adaptive design seeks to adaptively design the architecture of a model to optimize its energy efficiently. And lastly, hardware. Hardware aims to design energy efficient computing devices or platforms for specific AI applications. So let's jump a little deeply, get a little deeply into model compression. So model compression has been investigated for a long time by the AI community. There are some mature technologies for compressed deep neural network models. Uh, existing compression models include four categories. One, uh, parameter pruning and quantization, low rank factorization, transferred or compact convolutional filters, and lastly, knowledge distillation. The parameter pruning and quantization methods seek to figure out the redundancy of a model's parameters and remove the parameters which are not so sensitive to the performance. The low rank factorization method aims to use matrix or matrices or tensor decomposition to, ent to estimate the, informa the informative, informative parameter, uh, parameters, that is the parameters that are actually sensitive to the model's performance. Then we have the transferred slash compact convolutional filters, which try to design a special structural convolutional filter to save these parameters. And lastly, the category of compression methods knowledge distillation. So knowledge distillation is really important because knowledge, knowledge distillation first learns a large model, then uses its distilled knowledge to train a more compact model, which can significantly reduce the output of the large model. So as we mentioned before, Adaptive design methods aim to design a model's architecture to optimize its energy efficiency. So one of the representative strategies is the pruning approach. So in this work, the authors proposed a pruning approach to design a CNN architecture to achieve an energy saving goal. In their method, the model is pruned in layer by layer where the layer that consumes the most energy is pruned first. Another representative method is hyperparameter optimization. So in this work, the authors propose a framework to adaptively design a CNN model for image classification to achieve a certain energy consumption goal. So they do this by formulating the idea of a CNN architecture as a hyperparameter optimization problem under energy consumption restrictions and solve this by Bayesian optimization. So hardware, we move on to hardware. To solve the energy saving problem from the hardware perspective, the researchers have made these attempts. So in the first work, the new NPU, Neural Processing Unit, the authors design a Neural Processing Unit or NPU to efficiently execute some common computations in neural networks, such as multiplication, accumulation, sigmoid on chips. In the second work, Reno, the authors propose Authors propose Reno, a more advanced on-chip architecture for neural network acceleration. Then what's more? There are efficient computation designs or devices designed for a certain or specific neural network structures. For example, Regan. Regan is specifically designed for accelerating 
Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs for short. So here we can move on and I will introduce surveys and tools. So we have a number of tools here, five tools that I would briefly explain. So in this slide, we list several surveys slash papers that summarize research works on energy estimation and reduction of AI systems. So in the first survey, the estimation of energy consumption in machine learning, the authors, preserve, um, the authors present a comprehensive overview on energy consumption estimations from both the computer architecture and machine learning communities. They also provide a taxonomy uh, for methods and summarize the strengths and weaknesses of the methods in different categories. In the second survey, a survey of model comprehension, co compression and acceleration for deep neural networks. The authors summarize the common deep model compression techniques and organize them into four categories. The third survey, benchmarking the performance and energy efficiency of AI accelerators for AI training. The authors compare the performance and energy consumptions of different processors of AI training. In the fourth survey, a survey of methods for analyzing and improving GPU energy efficiency, the authors review the approaches for analyzing and improving GPU energy efficiency. And lastly, um, in the survey, a survey of accelerator architectures for deep neural networks. This survey summarize, uh, summarizes the last or latest research on DNN accelerator designs. So there are some public tools that can help us facilitate the environmental well being of AI systems. So the framework Synergy is integrated with the CAF or CAFE uh, framework for measuring and predicting the energy consumption of CNNs or convolutional neural networks. And a tool called machine learning emissions calculator is developed to estimate the carbon emissions of training uh, a machine learning model which can enable users to better understand the, the environmental impacts caused by their models. And finally, um, Accelergy. Accelergy and Time Loop are two representative energy estimation tools to facilitate the design of deep neural network accelerators. Um, and lastly, I will discuss the future directions in this field. So recently, AutoML, which is short for automated machine learning, emerges as a novel direction in the AI community. So AutoML actually aims to automatically design optimal model ac architectures for certain tasks. Existing works in AutoML focus on designing a model to improve its performance, but usually don't treat energy consumption saving as its highest priority. Um, at the algorithm level though, we can consider using AutoML techniques to design energy saving models. So they kind of work hand in hand. At the hardware level, current research on DNN accelerators pay much more attention to devising efficient deployment devices to facilitate uh, model inference. But the procedure of model training is a bit overlooked. The design of efficient training devices for DNN models is a promising direction to investigate in the future. So thank you guys so much. Um, this is the end of the environmental dimension and let's welcome Ichi when to introduce the next dimension. Sure, thanks, Jamal.
You're welcome. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, thanks, Jamil. So hello everyone. So this is Ichi from DSC Lab and it's my great honor to be here and to share something about trustworthy AI with you. Well, I first introduced the accountability and auditability of artificial intelligence, which are two very important perspectives for trustworthy AI. Then since we have introduced all the six key dimensions of trustworthy AI separately, we're going to discuss how they interact with each other, and they promote each other or restrain each other. We'll illustrate this with some uh, examples and finally, we will conclude our tutorial with some discussions about potential future work. Okay, uh, now let's get started with the accountability and auditability. Uh, although uh, AI has achieved impressive breakthroughs and success in numerous applications, there still exists lots of potential risks and harms human cannot afford. Here in this slide shows the negative example of AI model in a real application, which we have uh, already introduced previously. Uh, another negative example is about chatbot AI tape provided by Microsoft. Well, it turned out to be an extreme racist and made numerous nasty utterances in Twitter after some people tweeted the bot with all sorts of racist remarks. And this can cause very negative social impact, and it is definitely undesirable. Both these two examples show the potential risk and harm AI can bring to our society. And thus, it is extremely important for us to avoid such cases. To do this, an important task we need to do is to guarantee the accountability of artificial intelligence in the real world applications. Well, accountability for AI it has a very broad definition. On one hand, accountability can be interpreted as a property of AI from this perspective, accountability can be improved if any breakthroughs can be made in the explainability of AI algorithm. On the other hand, accountability can be referred to as a clear responsibility distribution, which focuses on who should take what responsibility for the impact of AI-based systems. Here, we mainly focus on discussing the second notion. Specifically, if negative cases such as the described examples happen, who should take the responsibility? And to what extent? A clear responsibility distribution can increase the sense of duty of the conductors and can also help elevate the potential risks and harms. Um, however, it is not trivial to give such a clear specification for responsibility. Since the operation of an AI-based system involves many different parties. Here we propose to five uh, different roles in AI systems, including system designers, system developers, decision makers, and users, and system auditors. Next, we'll describe these roles separately. The first comes the system designers. Um, system designers are the designers of their AI system, and they're supposed to design an AI system which meets their user requirements and is transparent and explainable to the greatest extent. Uh, it is their responsibility to offer deployment injunctions and user guidelines and to release potential risks. And decision makers have the right to determine whether to build an AI system and what AI system should be adopted. Uh, decision makers should be fully aware of the benefits and risks of the candidate AI system and take all the relevant requirements and regulations into um, overall consideration. Well, uh, system deployers are in charge of deploying an AI system. They are supposed to follow the deployment instructions and also to make sure that the system has been deployed appropriately. 
Also, they are expected to offer some hands-on tutorials to the end users. And finally, uh, the, the system auditors, uh, they are responsible for system auditing and are expected to provide comprehensive and objective assessments for the AI system. And last are end users uh, who are the practical operators of an AI system. Well, they are supposed to follow the user guidelines carefully and timely report emerging issues to the system deployers or the system designers. Well, these are five key roles we summarize for accountability for AI systems. And uh, it is important to clearly specify the responsibility for each role so that uh, we can better guarantee the accountability of the AI systems. And also this would be helpful for the auditability for uh, artificial intelligence. But next, we are going to introduce auditability. One of the most uh, important methodologies to ensure accountability of AI. Auditability can be understood as a set of principled assessment from various aspects. Um, it is popular and useful in all kinds of applications such as finance and business. And in the IEEE standard for software development, an audit is defined as uh, an independent evaluation of conformance of software products and processes to applicable regulations, standards, guidelines, plans, specifications, and procedures. Um, typically, audits can be divided into two categories as external ones and internal ones. Uh, so the, for the external ones, they refer to audits conducted by a third party, which is independent of the system designers or system deployers. The external audits are expected to share no common interest with the internal workers and are likely to provide some normal perspectives for auditing the AI system. And therefore, it is expected that the external audits can offer a comprehensive and objective audit report. Uh, however, there exist some um, obvious limitations in external audits. Um, first, external audits typically cannot access some important internal data, uh, such as the model training data or the mental, uh, the uh, specific implementation details, uh, which uh, increase the uh, difficulty of the auditing process. Also, external audits are always conducted after an AI system is deployed, so that it may be costly to make some adjustment over the system. And sometimes the system may have already done some harm. Uh, well, we can also have internal audits, which refer to the update of the external audits. Uh, specifically, internal audits refer to audits conducted by a group of people inside the system designer or system deployer. Um, compared with external audits, Internal audits can have access to the internal data, uh, including their model training data and their implementation details, which would make their internal audit much more convenient. Mm. Furthermore, internal audits can be conducted before a system is deployed. Uh, in this way, it can avoid some potential harm after the system deployment. Also, their internal audit report can serve as an important reference for the decision maker to make a good decision. Uh, however, an unavoidable shortcoming for internal audits is that um, they share the same interest with the audit party, uh, which makes it challenging to give a uh, relatively objective audit report. There, um, is a recent survey regarding the uh, accountability for algorithm. Uh, as shown in this slide, it offers a systematic uh, review of the work that has been done in the field of algorithm accountability. 
Uh, as for truthful accountability, uh, we would say that all the truth for the safety and robustness, non-discrimination and fairness, explainability, privacy, uh, environmental well-being can be used to help improve their accountability. And finally, let's conclude the dimension of accountability and auditability of artificial intelligence with some related future uh, directions. Uh, for accountability, it is important to further enhance the explainability of AI system. Only we one way can have a deep and several understanding of its theory and mechanism. Can we fully rely on something or make a well-recognized responsibility distribution? Uh, while for auditability, it would always be a good option to conduct both the external one and the internal one, so that we can have a comprehensive and objective overview of this AI system. Furthermore, we can we need to be aware of that an AI system is constant, constantly dynamic. It can change with input data and environment. And thus, to make an effective and timely audit, it is necessary to audit the system um, periodically and update auditing principles with the system changes. Well, now that we have finished the detailed introduction of all six dimensions for trustworthy AI. Let's have some discussion over these dimensions from an integrated perspective. A natural question is how these six dimensions influence each other? Uh, well, the answer is these six dimensions are not independent of each other. The realization of one dimension could actually promote or violate another dimension. In other words, there exist both accordance and the conflicts among these six dimensions. First, let's come to the accordance among different interactions. We will illustrate two specific examples. The first example is robustness and explainability. Uh, some recent studies show that the learning models robustness towards adversarial attacks positively correlates with their explainability. Uh, specifically, a recent study shows that models trained with robust objective show more interpretable silencing maps. As demonstrated in this slide, the right figure that denotes the silency map of a more robust network compared to the middle one. And it gives a much clean, cleaner indication of discriminative features of the real image shown in the left. The second positive example is fairness and environmental well being. Fairness is in the field of uh, artificial intelligence is a broad topic which involves not only the fairness of uh, AI service providers and users, but also the equ equality of AI researchers. The development trend for deep learning models towards larger models and more computing resource consumption not only cause adverse, adverse environmental impact, but also uh, exaggerate the equality of research, since most researchers cannot afford high performance computing devices. Besides the cases where two dimensions promote each other, there also exist cases where two dimensions have conflict with each other. So the first negative pair we're going to introduce is the privacy and robustness. There exists work showing that models trained with adversarial defense approach are actually more likely to expose sensitive information in training data while membership inference attacks. Also, robustness and fairness can also be conflict with each other in particular scenarios. There are recent work indicating that the adversarial training algorithm improves the robustness of a model at the expense of its fairness. 
The last um, conflict example is fairness and privacy. Some recent work investigates the uh, compatibility of fairness and the privacy of classification models and theoretically prove that different, different um, privacy and exact uh, fairness in terms of equal opportunity are unlikely to be achieved simultaneously. Now we have introduced all the dimensions and their interactions. We will include our tutorial, conclude our uh, tutorial with uh, some discussion over the future directions. There are three possible future directions we want to emphasize here. And the first one is the human agency and oversight. The human autonomy is one of the most important principles for AI technology. Human autonomy requires humans to keep self-determination. To achieve the principle of human autonomy, the design of AI systems should be human-centered. Specifically, human agency and oversight should be guaranteed in the development and the de uh, of AI systems. Uh, the next uh, future direction is credibility. With the wide deployment of AI systems, people increasingly rely on the content provided by artificial intelligence. Thus, we need additional mechanisms and approaches to guarantee the credibility of this content. And the last future direction is to consider the interaction among different dimensions for trustworthy AI. As discussed in the previous section, Different dimensions of trust with the AI can interact with each other in a co accordant or conflicting manner. Besides the several um, we introduced just now, there are potential interactions between uh, other dimensions pairs remaining to be investigated. Uh, in addition, the interaction formed between two dimensions can be different in different scenarios, and this needs more exploration. Uh, well, this is the end for our tutorial, and if you want to check more details about the topics we discussed on this tutorial, you can refer to our recent survey for Trustworthy AI by scanning the QR code shown in this slide. All the contents in this tutorial have been covered in this way, and please feel free to read it if you have further interest. Uh, last but not least, thanks to this great opportunity offered by GWW uh, 2022, and thank all the lab mates from DSE, collaborators from PolyU and Sony AI, and thanks for the funding support from uh, all the organizations, and great thanks for all of your uh, audience. Thank you. Okay, so this is the end of our tutorial. Thank you all for listening. After the tutorial, we will release our uh, latest tutorial slides and the video. We will make them available on our website. So welcome to visit our website to check. Thanks again.